So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Lynn Nygaard and I'm the director for the Center um, for Mind, Brain and Culture. And we're delighted to welcome Dr. Dan Weiskopf to our virtual CNBC and virtual Emory. Um, we've been wanting to have Dan come give a talk and, uh, and, uh, and this is, we finally got him. So we're really pleased to have him. Um, Dan is the um, professor of philosophy, is a professor of philosophy at uh, Georgia State University and associate faculty in the Neuroscience Institute at GSU. Um, he received his BA from the University of California at Berkeley, his MA from Brown University and his doctorate in the philosophy neuroscience psychology program at Washington University in St. Louis. He currently maintains the concepts area of Phil Papers and serves as an associate editor for the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science. Dan's um, scholarship addresses broadly the philosophy of cognitive science, the philosophy of science, and the philosophy of mind. Dan's work has focused um, on the nature of representation in mind, science, and art. Um, and his research has drawn upon evidence from psychology, neuroscience, and anthropology, a truly interdisciplinary look at uh, the study of the mind and brain to uncover the uh, structure of higher cognition and its relationship to perception, action, the body, and the world. Um, uh, throughout his career, and also more recently, he's also investigated the experimental and modeling strategies that are used by the cognitive and behavioral sciences to explain the workings of mind brain. Um, he's also written on mechanistic explanations in psychology and neuroscience, um, exploring topics such as including reductionism in cognitive brain sciences and the extent to which techniques like data mining and modeling, other modeling techniques provide truly explanatory accounts of mind brain and behavior. In addition to his book, An Introduction to the Philosophy of Psychology with Fred Adams um, from Cambridge University Press, Dan's published extensively on his work uh, examining the nature of representation in mind and science. And in addition, uh, Dan's also published um, extensively on topics in visual arts, including the limits of visual representation, the ontogeny of artwork in the post-medium age and the role of judgment in contemporary art criticism. Um, Dan's going to talk today about his research on ethno-ontology and the ideas of nature across culture. And the title of his talk today is The Myth of Natural Categories, Representing and Coordinating Ethnobiological Knowledge. So please join me in welcoming Dan Weiskopf. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. Yay. <laughs> Boxes. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Lynn. Uh, thanks to everyone at the CNBC for uh, making this happen uh, through what has been a year of truly weird delays, and uh, there's no no prospects that the weirdness will let up anytime soon, so we might as well just settle in for it for the next hour at least. Um, so, all right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. It's great to be here. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, jump right in with this talk uh, because it's probably a little bit overstuffed uh, as usual here. But um, so uh, this talk constitutes uh, what you might think of as a contribution to the natural history of natural knowledge. So knowledge of the natural world has been created many times over by different communities in ways that reflect their distinctive characteristics. And when we view this uh, knowledge comparatively, it looks on the surface at least to be quite heterogeneous in its form and its content. The categories that are picked out and the causal explanatory networks that they occupy seem to depend on the particulars of a group's history, organization, needs, goals, and values. And this fact comes into particularly sharp focus when we look comparatively at the way that natural knowledge is developed in different communities. Uh, so for example, Consider the way that uh, knowledge of nature is developed and deployed in scientific disciplines, uh, in governmental bodies that deal with environment and ecology, in corporations and industries uh, interested in exploiting the natural world, in conservation enterprises, and in development organizations and other non-governmental organizations, all of whom develop uh, an interest in uh, the natural world and develop theories and models and explanations and ways of engaging with the natural world. On the other hand, contrast this 
with uh, the knowledge of nature that's developed by indigenous groups who have uh, traditional knowledge of nature and traditional practices of engaging with uh, the natural world. Uh, there's been intense interest uh, uh, between groups on the left-hand side in what's going on in groups on the right-hand side in recent years. Indigenous knowledge of nature has been a focus of intense interest and investigation. There are a number of reasons why this is true. One is uh, the hope that indigenous knowledge will shed light on species conservation and resource management, that it will provide insights into drugs and medical treatments, uh, this kind of uh, biopharmaceutical, uh, sometimes called biopiracy, uh, 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 is a great interest on the part of pharmaceutical companies, and simple scientific curiosity about the biological diversity found in indigenous lands. So uh, academic ecological knowledge, as uh, exemplified on the left hand, has been very interested in traditional knowledge on the right hand. And these inquiries have coalesced around a common overarching project to find ways to integrate traditional knowledge with the knowledge produced by scientific, corporate, governmental, and NGO-based knowledge of nature. So this integration project has taken place within a framework of a particular myth. Uh, based on what, what I'm going to call a myth. Uh, you can guess my views about it. Um, so uh, this is what I'm calling the myth of natural categories. This is the idea that there exist divisions and patterns in nature that systems of classification will tend to converge on across communities and, uh, and across cultures. Uh, in ethnobiology, this was uh, thought of as a kind of convergence metaphysics, that there will be a, a kind of co coming together of the way that so sciences see the world and the way that indigenous groups uh, see the world. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm going to uh, challenge this myth. I think it is a myth, and I think it has misled us about the structure of ethnobiological knowledge held by indigenous groups and about the ways in which we can productively engage with this knowledge to uh, benefit all parties. So uh, let's get started. Um, the first thing I want to do here is to lay out some definitions and clear the ground uh, a little bit. Uh, so uh, what I mean here by traditional ecological knowledge, this is a semi-technical term in the literature, uh, and traditional ecological knowledge, uh, these are uh, Yanomami uh, making uh, poison uh, to use in hunting, uh, traditional ecological knowledge can be defined in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm going to follow Fikret Berke's uh, influential definition uh, and define it as a cumulative body of knowledge, practice, and belief evolving by adaptive processes and handed down through generations by cultural transmission about the relationships of living beings, including humans with one another and with their environment. And there are a few things I'd like to highlight here. The first is that this is not just about what is known abstractly, but also about bodies of practice, about things that are done materially, that are done with bodies, that are done socioculturally uh, in the world in various ways. Uh, the second is the adaptive aspect of this. These these, uh, this knowledge is adaptive in the sense that it aids in the flourishing and survival of the groups that hold it in various ways. And indeed, this is the primary aim towards which uh, it has to accommodate itself, is this, this kind of adaptive process. Finally, this knowledge is handed down by general mechanisms of cultural transmission rather than by, uh, say, institutionalized pedagogy and teaching, which has its own kinds of norms and structures. These are, by and large, uh, absent uh, in these frameworks. In contrast with this, uh, here's a Hong Kong science park, uh, academic ecological knowledge uh, is uh, knowledge about living beings and the environment created by formal named disciplines passed on via institutionalized pedagogy and evolving subject to distinctive epistemic norms and investigative constraints. So note the points of contrast here. First of all, the, the social uh, and, uh, and, and institutional uh, organizations here are specialized knowledge gathering uh, organizations, specialized bureaus or disciplines for gathering knowledge. Uh, this is what I mean by the formal named disciplines here. They have associated means of teaching and passing on this knowledge. And the way in which this knowledge changes is not directed primarily towards the survival of groups, but rather towards epistemic aims, towards discovering truth, finding explanations, making predictions, and so on. So the normative structure, as well as the social structure of academic ecological knowledge is uh, quite different. So what we've got here is a picture of two kinds of knowledge created by two uh, distinctively structured investigative uh, communities. And the question is, how can we bring the knowledge that is generated by these communities into contact? 
Uh, side note, you might be wondering why I don't say scientific ecological knowledge here. There is a reason. Um, <laughs> I'll say more about it if people want to know at the end, but I want to emphasize the institutional nature of things here, and science itself doesn't quite capture that. So those are the definitions. Now, what is the project? Well, the project is, uh, it's uh, organized around this question. Can we integrate TEK and AEK, as these have come to be called, right? Tech and AC, I don't know how to pronounce that last one, but uh, can we integrate these into a single coherent uh, body of knowledge? That is, can we take the, uh, the information that is known in each of these two, uh, uh, these two social contexts of knowledge production and bring them together in some way? Uh, well, to know what the answer to this question is, we have to say a little bit more about what we mean by integration. The term uh, integrate shows up all over the literature on this. It's not often defined, but I think from looking at research in ethnobiology, we can tease out uh, the meaning of the term uh, a little bit better. So uh, what I mean by integrate here uh, is uh, a practice of, uh, of bringing together knowledge structures that occurs against the background of two key assumptions. So the two assumptions that are framing the integration project uh, constitute what I'm going to call the background of realism. Uh, realism is a loaded term. Philosophers are probably already reaching for their revolvers at this point when you say something like that. But uh, uh, realism here is uh, meant to be a gesture towards the kind of scientific realism held by uh, someone like Richard Boyd, which is at the moment the dominant way of understanding and interpreting academic knowledge and scientific knowledge in particular. And my claim is that the realist assumptions present here have also guided investigations into uh, the structure of traditional ecological knowledge. And for my purposes, what we mean by realism is given by two assumptions. So the first is called the referential assumption. This states that a theory's ontology is entirely captured by the reference of the terms that are used in the theory. Uh, so theories have a bunch of uh, key concepts and key terms that play roles in specifying the kinds of uh, kinds and properties and causal explanatory structures that they're meant to delimit. And the ontology of a theory is just given entirely by uh, the reference of those key terms in the theory. And that's all there is to ontology is the reference of those terms. I'll show how this works in a moment. The second assumption is what I'll call the autonomy assumption. And the autonomy assumption says that biological beliefs, and here I'm restricting myself to uh, beliefs about the living world and our place in it, so that's why the biological qualifier goes in here. Biological beliefs and practices can be assessed apart from their role in a larger cultural matrix. That is, uh, the investigation of the biological world, right, of the kind of ecology and the natural world generally, can be, it is a kind of investigation that can be carried out uh, in its own, as it were, a separate investigative domain. Uh, that it forms a, uh, a, a semantic, conceptual, and investigative whole that can be, uh, that, that can be looked at uh, no matter what's going on elsewhere in other investigative domains, at least to a substantial degree, and certainly independently of what's going on elsewhere in the culture that's doing the investigating. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about this uh, as well. But both of these are part of the background of realism uh, in this case. So to see how these two assumptions work in practice, uh, let's consider an example. This is really taken almost at random from an ethnobiological study by Diamond and Bishop, 1999. This is uh, a ornithological study of the Katangban uh, people of Papua New Guinea. So uh, these kinds of tables are absolutely everywhere in ethnobiology. And I think that they show the centrality of the referential assumption quite nicely. So on the left, you've got uh, a list of English vernacular names of birds, dusky lorry, rainbow lorikeet, and so on. In the middle, you've got the scientific names of those birds, various kinds of parrots uh, given by their Linnaean binomial classifications. And on the right, you've got the Katangban names uh, for them. And the name of the game, so to speak, is to find correspondences between these things, to find co-references between terms in Katangban, English vernacular terms, and scientific names. Uh, so in this study, they found 169 vernacular names, mapped them onto 143 species names, and concluded that, that the Katangbans were, in fact, tracking the same categories as the sciences were to a large degree, that their ontologies overlapped. This is what I mean by the referential assumption. Uh, and as another example of this in practice, here's a nice quote from Eugene Hun and uh, Thornton in 2010. 
They say such cross-linguistic comparisons make, made use of an edict grid or meta-language to characterize the referential meanings of local terms. For comparative ethnobiological studies, the edict grid is the Linnaean system of biological classification and nomenclature. So in other words, uh, this is the way that you map the referential meanings of uh, uh, indigenous terms onto terms in the sciences, and that's how you assess their uh, referential uh, overlap with, uh, with your targets. So uh, that's the referential assumption. Now, what about the autonomy assumption? Well, uh, I think that autonomy is very clearly characteristic of academic ecological knowledge. And you can see this if you look at the history. Uh, I can't go into the enormous uh, uh, kind of background of the history of, uh, of the various disciplines here, uh, the history of natural history, so to speak. Uh, but, uh, but notice that if you look at the development of natural history, especially at the development of zoology and botany, the taxonomic schemes that are used in these two sciences struggled for a long time to purify their categories of the vestiges of practical utility. It was quite an intellectual effort to get rid of the, uh, the utilitarian aspects of these classifications in the, various, uh, in the various scientific classifications used in zoology and botany. That is to make them autonomous from the other kinds of concerns that might, might be, brought to be brought to bear on this. I think incidentally that this is actually characteristic of the emergence of disciplines in general uh, I think that what it, what it means to have disciplines is to achieve this kind of bureaucratization of knowledge. Uh, I think that's arguably uh, a kind of general feature of modernity uh, and that the development of disciplines as we know them involves the separating out of spheres of knowledge in exactly this kind of way. So I don't think it's an accident that autonomy winds up being a governing assumption for academic knowledge uh, because these are characteristic formations of modernity. Uh, but if you look back in pre-modern times, the herbals uh, uh, were initially rich in medicinal and practical categories prior to the 16th century when scientific botany got started. Uh, and zoological handbooks uh, included many distinctions, uh, even until the, late into the 19th century, among game and domesticated animals, categories that could only be useful to human beings and don't exist as part of nature. Uh, so autonomy is a hard-won struggle. Okay. Uh, so that's the, uh, the integration project involves, uh, it plays out against the background of these assumptions. And the success conditions for integration then are as follows. Uh, you'll have successful integration when TEK and AEK's theoretical content have the right form to overlap with only minimal distortion. And when they share epistemically regulated knowledge production practices that are characterized by this kind of autonomy. Uh, I'll say a little bit about how this overlap works uh, in a moment, and then I'll show you that it actually doesn't hold, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, this, these are the uh, kinds of conditions. So spoiler, uh, we're not going to meet these conditions, but that takes a little bit of showing. OK, so uh, what do I mean by ontological overlap here? Well, there are a couple of ways that, uh, that uh, knowledge, bodies of knowledge can overlap. One is in the categories that they posit. So uh, take a term like jaguar, which maps onto uh, the uh, Linnaean classification Panthera omca, and then take a term Balam from uh, Mayan. Uh, uh, the Mayan term Balam and Panthera omca map onto the same creature, jaguars, so you have a case of category overlap. This is a successful case of ontological uh, integration. On the other hand, uh, Bayarishpa, which is a Zapotec uh, term for, uh, roughly speaking, things that fly near the ground. Uh, it includes both birds and butterflies and some insects and some other things. Uh, the near the ground flyers are all Bayarishpa. Uh, but of course, we don't have terms like that in, uh, in academic or in vernacular classification. We call them birds and butterflies. And to this extent, the categories fail to overlap. Uh, so there's a success and a failure. The same thing is true for the properties that get posited in these theories. So if you have a category like jaguars, uh, you ascribe to jaguars lots of properties as you're studying them. So uh, here's a bunch of properties of jaguars that you might pick out. Uh, and uh, these properties might either be the same or different depending on the body of knowledge that you're looking at. So within academic uh, knowledge of nature and within traditional knowledge of nature, you might pick out some of the same categories, the ones at the top that are highlighted, the same properties, right? Maybe the morphological and behavioral features of jaguars are the same, but only academic uh, knowledge of nature picks out genetic features. Those are absent from traditional knowledge and only traditional knowledge picks out the role of jaguars in shamanic rituals. So uh, the properties here can either overlap or diverge depending on the system of knowledge. Uh, that's a second way you can have either success or failure in the case of overlap. 
Third, you can have explanatory overlap. And explanatory overlap is overlap in the kind of causal explanatory model of a particular domain uh, that you have in mind. So uh, I'll give you three examples of this very briefly. Uh, suppose that you're trying to grow manioc. It's a good thing to do if you're trying to survive in uh, South and Central America, you want to grow some manioc. Uh, now, the theory of how to cultivate uh, manioc successfully might be something that is shared both by indigenous groups that do it on a regular basis and by academic specialists in cultivating these kinds of crops. That is, they might converge on the same theory of how to successfully cultivate manioc. On the other hand, suppose you want to know what's going to happen if you brew uh, this particular plant into an extract and make a, make a drink out of it and consume it. What's it going to do to you? Well, you might have uh, two quite different theories of what happens under those conditions. Uh, one of them is a theory of divinatory ritual efficacy. You'll have uh, a certain kind of vision and go on a spiritual journey uh, and so on. Uh, the, there's, a, there's an entire cosmological and uh, spiritual theory of what happens uh, to you when you consume this beverage. On the other hand, in academic circles, you're likely to get a molecular neuro, uh, neuropharmacological explanation of why you have those unusual altered states. So there might be some overlap here, but certainly many differences as well. Finally, suppose you're wanting to know, if you're a hunter, how can I regain my luck in hunting? Uh, it's gone bad recently, and I need to do something to get, uh, get better at it. Well, you might appeal to a theory of hunting magic uh, if you're in uh, an indigenous context in the right one. Uh, and that might tell you how to regain your luck. And there might be a whole theory about how to do that. On the other hand, uh, within academic ecological knowledge, there would be no theory of that, or at best, a debunking theory. Uh, so explanatory overlap can either be total, partial, or null uh, in all of these cases. Uh, so uh, these are the parameters uh, of, uh, of integration. Uh, it can involve overlap in any of these three aspects. So how much overlap is there in practice? Well, I'm going to argue not much. In fact, what we find is not overlap, but alterity. Uh, and I'm going to go through three cases corresponding to these three domains. And I'm going to uh, argue by reference to just a few examples, but I can give more in discussion, of cases where this overlap fails. And then I'll offer a diagnosis of what's going on in these cases. So first of all, consider the case of uh, category overlap. What we find when we compare the ontology of uh, traditional ecological knowledge to that of academic ecological knowledge is that there are many ontological novel entities uh, within uh, traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, and to sum this up, I would say that indigenous worldviews are pervasively agentive. Uh, not all of them are, and not all of them are in the same ways. This is a rough statistical generalization over a lot of anthropological and ethnographic data. Uh, but uh, animism, for example, is a well-known, well-studied uh, tendency across uh, a lot of, uh, of indigenous uh, societies. And by pervasively agentive here, what I mean is indigenous worldviews tend to posit beings such as spirits, whether they're ancestral or natural, that have agent-like qualities. And they tend to extend these qualities to many seemingly non-agentive beings. So plants are often ascribed aspects of consciousness and purpose. Uh, they're thought of as being responsive to our communicative uh, overtures. Uh, rocks are thought of in, in uh, Inca cosmology as having uh, a kind of consciousness and as being agent-like uh, and being the kinds of things that you can uh, make pleas to and so on. Uh, so the, uh, the ascription of agentive uh, characteristics uh, widely is a feature of the ontology of a lot of indigenous worldviews. Uh, I'll give you one example of this just to uh, show how it works. This is the case of the, uh, the Itzamaya and the Aruks. So the Itza are uh, a, a group of lowland Mayas in Guatemala living in Patan municipality, uh, mostly in a single settlement right now. Uh, they were down to about 900 inhabitants uh, a, a couple of years ago, um, and only 20 speakers of the indigenous language as of 2013. You can only expect that that is unfortunately declining to zero uh, rapidly because nobody is learning it. Uh, but um, uh, the ITSA have been widely studied by Scott Atran, uh, Douglas Medine, and uh, their collaborators. And uh, one aspect of uh, it's a, not only it's a cosmology, but also it's a natural knowledge is that they appeal to uh, beings known as uh, Aruks. And the Aruks are guardian spirits. The term that, they are, that is used for them, though, is things of the forest, which is exactly the same term that is used to describe animals. 
That is, the Aruks are thought of as a part of nature, as being living beings that are, but you know, they're not quite like animals, but they are kin to animals. Uh, so uh, the immediate rejoinder that these are supernatural and therefore not part of nature doesn't seem to get a lot of traction because they're well integrated into the ecological theory of what happens in the forest. Uh, so they sometimes appear as tricksters and sometimes as helpers. Uh, their appearance is kind of interesting. Uh, the claim is that they look like uh, little little short men wearing hats. I don't know where the hats come from, but uh, you, you you can't see them uh, when they're uh, when they're entering a village or when they're sitting in a tree and they live in caves. You can only see them when they're walking away, which uh, I find actually rather haunting. Uh, I often feel like that. Uh, so uh, it's uh, they're, they're, they have these kinds of magical qualities. They sometimes kidnap children uh, and then they bring them back and so on. Uh, but their primary role is to patrol the use of forest resources and to the encourage the appropriate protection of species. That is, they function as protectors and guardians. They often don't themselves act in this capacity though. What they do is they act to protect the forest by threatening to punish humans <laughs> who, don't, uh, who don't shepherd these, these resources uh, in the right way. So the role of the Aruks in the theory of the woods is to impose norms backed by the threat of punishments. And the, uh, so the, the interesting thing about this is that uh, they, at least among older generations of Itza, uh, there are, they are quite literally believed in and uh, hunters and other conservationists seem to uh, take the desires of the, they, they claim to see them and, they're, and uh, they behave in accordance with what the Aruks want. And the reason I want to say that this is part of their ecological knowledge is because uh, the beliefs about what the Aruks want and what they are align with knowledge of the forest ecology and with the knowledge of culturally important plant species. As knowledge of the Aruks has declined, as the Maya have become, uh, uh, as their culture has been destroyed by uh, narco trafficking, logging, uh, language loss, and other things, uh, knowledge of the Aruks has disappeared, and in concert with it, knowledge of the forest ecology and uh, knowledge of which plants and species are valuable and important has also declined. The fact that these decline in concert suggests that the Aruks are playing an important role in maintaining uh, the knowledge of nature that the Itza have. Uh, so uh, these ontologically novel entities are uh, important in this way. I can give other examples of this tendency uh, later on, but that's enough, I think, on this. Uh, a second example of uh, ontological novelty in, in indigenous worldviews uh, is, is uh, ontologically novel properties. So we've looked at categories, now we'll look at some properties. Uh, ontologically novel properties can be exemplified here by the fact that indigenous worldviews represent nature as being permeated by magical powers. Um, so what do I mean by magical powers? <laughs> well, it sounds, I don't, I don't mean that uh, in a pejorative sense, I mean it in a, uh, a purely uh, descriptive sense. Magical powers here are forces that can be tapped and channeled by some kinds of knowledgeable initiates to curse, bless, and otherwise manipulate events. Uh, there are lots of different names that these powers uh, go by uh, in Afro-Brazilian uh, Afro, uh, 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 candomblé, it's called Ache. Uh, there, it has, these forces have got different names, um, but the idea that there are such powers and that they can be manipulated in various ways and that the manipulation is connected with the manipulation of various parts of nature is something that is found uh, pervasively. So herbs and parts of plants are often thought of as the inductors for these magical powers. Uh, you know, the, the right kind of root, the right kind of flower, or the right kind of stem, if it's processed in the right way, will allow you to alter the world uh, directly. Uh, the same thing goes for parts of animals, their bones, their skin, uh, their organs, and so on. Um, there are a lot of uh, examples of this. Uh, and it's important to note here as well that it's tempting to say, well, these are all actually proto-medicinal in some way. This is actually not, these are not magical, but these are uh, uh, something else. They're part of uh, an, an early uh, medicinal or uh, scientific attempt to manipulate the world, and magic is a misnomer. I don't think that it is, uh, in part for the reason that there actually doesn't seem to be a well-respected difference between medicine and magic <laughs> in a lot of these contexts. Uh, Robert Vox and uh, Tinde van Andel have looked a lot at the Brazilian contexts here in particular, and there, there are some differences in which uh, of these products are used medicinally and which are used uh, magically, but 
whether a cure is being effected magically or medicinally is not something that is well established because medicine itself is underpinned by many of the same magical forces. So I'll give an example of how this works in practice again. Uh, and here I'm going to draw on some ethnographic research uh, about the, uh, the Hoti, who are uh, an indigenous group living in, uh, Ven uh, in the Venezuelan Guyana. Uh, again, uh, the population of the Hoti is about 900 individuals. Uh, the work I'm drawing he on here comes from Stanford and Eglé Zent, who have done some really quite extraordinary and detailed studies here. So I'm indebted to them on these points. Uh, the Hody, prior to contact in 1969, uh, lived by uh, as trekking hunter-gatherers, and since then they have become uh, moderately more sedentary and have, uh, have established at least some permanent settlements uh, and have taken up horticulture and fishing. Uh, but most of their time is still uh, gathering, uh, and um, only a minority of it is uh, these kinds of uh, sedentary pursuits. Uh, and uh, Hody cosmology uh, takes plants to be absolutely central. Uh, plants are thought of as uh, powerful beings that can perpetuate or end the dynamics of life, as having multiple characters, as being uh, having animate-like qualities, almost trickster-like themselves in various ways. Uh, so plants and fungi in the Hody uh, way of thinking about the world have got these kinds of magical powers. And if you just process them in the right kind of ways, you can do uh, all kinds of things with them. So here are uh, some images from the Zent's papers. On the left is a Hody hunter being uh, anointed with uh, a mushroom-based preparation. And on the right is a child who has found an enormous, <laughs> an enormous mushroom. Uh, he's very proud of himself, uh, as he should be. Uh, that's a big mushroom. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, the Hody magical inventory includes uh, 107 folk botanical species and seven types of fungi. So it's really quite an extensive theoretical armamentarium. Um, and uh, the fungi are used widely in two forms of hunting rituals, preparation and purification. Uh, so in preparing for a hunt, you will, prepare, you will make a magical preparation out of these fungi and it will get you ready and steady your aim and uh, give you luck. And if you do something wrong in hunting, you can purify yourself uh, by using the right kind of fungal preparation as well. Purification is particularly required when animals are mishandled during killing or burial. And I'll give an example of this uh, in a moment. Uh, so uh, the core mechanism that is implicit in this is what the Zents call essence interpenetration. Essence interpenetration is a causal process that involves the transfer of conjoined material and imm immaterial qualities from one life form to another by close physical contact or by ingestion. So here you are, a hunter on the bottom. Uh, they hunt with blowpipes, but those are flutes. Uh, so uh, you're, you're there hunting, and suppose you're hunting a spider monkey. And in, in handling the corpse of the spider monkey, you spill this substance that's contained in it called waya. Waya is a bile-like yellowish greenish substance that they think that all animals contain. It doesn't seem to correspond to the same substance in every animal, but uh, they all have waya of some kind. Uh, and if you spill it, if you don't bury the animal correctly or if you don't handle the body correctly when you're, um, uh, you're getting ready to eat it, uh, you will fall prey to misfortune. It's a mark of disrespect and it will cling to you and bring you bad luck. It will be a spiritual impurity that needs to be purged. So to purge it, you need to find the appropriate natural remedy. In this case, a particular kind of mushroom. And uh, it's the resemblance between the spider monkey waya and the mushroom that's supposed to be to indicate why that's the one to use. And I'll say some more about these kinds of pairings in a moment. But you find the mushroom, you prepare it, and the essence contained in the mushroom will realign the material and spiritual aspects of the hunter's body, and they'll be able to hunt again. Uh, so uh, the unlucky essence is transferred by the waya and the, it's uh, cured by the spiritual qualities of the mushroom. Uh, needless to say, none of these causal powers occur in any academic ecological accounts of hunting behavior. Finally, uh, there are ontologically disjoint explanatory schema in these cases. Uh, and what I mean here is that indigenous worldviews contain causal explanatory patterns that don't occur in academic ecological knowledge. And again, what I have in mind here is uh, the kinds of patterns that are exemplified by sympathetic magic, what Fraser called sympathetic magic, in particular by the three laws of similarity, contagion, and opposites. I'll give two examples of these magical causal explanatory patterns focusing on the law of similarity and the law of contagion. So uh, consider the law of similarity. This is also sometimes called the doctrine of signatures. Uh, if you look at uh, history of natural history, 
And what it says, roughly speaking, is that like causes like, or that causes and effects resemble one another. So for instance, uh, if you look at lung wart, it looks like a lung. And if you uh, take it, you will have improved pulmonary function. That's because it's like a lung. So you'll fix your lungs if you take that. Uh, if you look at the tortoise, it's slow, uh, the yellow spotted tortoise. And if you make a preparation of the tortoise and consume it, you will reduce your anxiety and become calm. Uh, it's the resemblance between these things that indicates what they're uh, good for. Needless to say, this principle doesn't play a role in uh, academic uh, biology in any way, uh, but it does play a prominent role in traditional ecological knowledge of various kinds. More interestingly, uh, the law of contagion uh, uh, is prominent here as well, and we've already seen one case of forward contagion. Uh, handling wire Im Im improperly can cause a hunter to become impure. Uh, the contagion passes from the wire to the hunter, and it needs to be remedied somehow by something that can uh, wash it out magically. More interestingly is this case of backward co contagion, or what is sometimes called by Alfred Gell, uh, volt sorcery. Uh, and in uh, this is uh, a common causal pattern in a lot of uh, witchcraft. And the way this works is uh, a vehicle, a piece of hair, a piece of skin or blood or an image or something personal like a diary or an item of clothing travels from a source agent to a target agent. Uh, the target agent acts on the vehicle in some way. And the negative consequences of this action propagate backwards to the source agent. So they might burn the hair or burn the blood or deface the diary or something like that. And by acting on the vehicle, the, the source is harmed. Uh, now, needless to say, this kind of backward causal chain is not, uh, doesn't, doesn't we think occur in any, uh, ca any causal processes in academic ecological uh, knowledge, but it is prominent, uh, a prominent form of reasoning in witch witchcraft-based explanations in indigenous knowledge. So these are three cases where we have failures of overlap. And I think that the examples I've given are brief, but they illustrate relatively pervasive trends. So the interim conclusion here and the diagnosis I would reach at this point is that traditional ecological knowledge, insofar as it's characterized this way, fails the referential overlap criterion uh, in indefinitely many cases uh, because it contains categories, properties, and explanatory schemes that don't occur and indeed can't occur in academic ecological knowledge. But I think that there's a deeper reason why this is true. This isn't an accident that it happens this way. There's quite a deep reason and the reason is because traditional eco ecological knowledge is not an autonomous discrete package of cultural information. It is in fact distributed and heterarchical. Uh, it is not an autonomous bureau of investigating the world governed only by epistemic norms. Uh, it, is, uh, it is responsible for accommodating itself to all of the demands of culture taken as a whole. And precisely because it is part of a, uh, a network of practices that are responsible to, uh, that, that together are responsible for adapting themselves to the flourishing and survival of cultures and groups as a whole. Uh, this is why it, it diverges from the kinds of classifications and explanations that are present in uh, academic ecological knowledge. So in other words, the failure of autonomy gives rise to the failure of reference uh, and both of them fall. Uh, I have an illustration of how you might want to visualize this. So here, is a, a caribou and imagine that you're a, a Cree. The Cree know a lot about caribou. Uh, and, but what they know about caribou is actually distributed across all kinds of separate uh, groups, practices, uh, material aspects of culture. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, these things can only be pried apart conceptually, I would say. Uh, you can only pry them apart if you draw circles and write words in them. <laughs> uh, in the real world, these are not uh, separate. I've only represented them separately, but that is, in fact, a kind of misrepresentation, right? Uh, so all of these things deal with caribou. Uh, naming and nomenclature, uh, there are systems of naming natural categories. You might be able to track them and hunt them. They might have a role in rituals and spiritual practices. There are many, many material uses for caribou and cultural narratives that they participate in. And in fact, simple lists of information and facts about their life cycle, migration, and so on. There's a weave of interlocking practices focused on a single category in these cases. But the accommodation demands of this interlocking set don't align with the epistemic norms of academic ecological knowledge. In fact, these aren't even separate at all. These are interacting and interdigitating in various ways. Where in all of this is ecological knowledge? Well, the answer is nowhere and everywhere. Uh, so 
this is uh, the diagnosis that I would offer, at least, of, of uh, why the structure of traditional ecological knowledge gives rise to the kinds of failures of overlap that make it extremely unlikely that the integration project is going to succeed. Of course, that's very fast, and nobody should be convinced by any of it. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll try to say uh, a little bit more uh, to give us a positive note to sort of end on here. Um, uh, for all this shows, of course, integration may be possible. It might be possible if these are marginal examples that could be, for instance, uh, dealt with as merely symbolic practices, right? Uh, so some people want to say, well, that's symbolism. It's not real ecological knowledge, right? Maybe taxonomy is where the action is at. And if you look at the taxonomic schemes, you can do things that uh, the rest of the culture can't. That is, you could carve out a domain of autonomy within indigenous knowledge. Uh, many people like doing that. Or maybe these are not really that widespread across uh, indigenous worldviews. I think that that's wrong, but of course it's a large task to show that and I haven't done it here. Uh, so I haven't really shown that integration as defined in this uh, talk is impossible. Uh, but I hope I have at least shown that there are some very sharp limits on how much commonality we should ex expect to find among bodies of uh, natural knowledge. We shouldn't, I think, expect to find very much commonality among bodies of knowledge that are uh, held by indigenous societies uh, and held by the various academic disciplines that study nature because the sociological and normative uh, differences in the way those communities are organized will give rise to differences in the knowledge that they produce. Um, so uh, I think that the integration project as defined here uh, is not on the cards and indeed I think integration itself is a misleading model of knowledge exchange. Uh, I think it misleads us uh, quite substantially about uh, what is going on when we make contact between uh, academic, uh, academic knowledge communities and indigenous knowledge communities. Uh, I think also that it tends to efface the material, social, and political facts about what goes on in those encounters. I think, in fact, that by focusing on the product as a kind of uh, integrated knowledge structure and ignoring the context in which that is produced and ignoring the methods uh, and uh, constraints and values uh, that are at play in the context in which it's produced, I think we mislead ourselves quite badly about what's going on in these exchanges. So I'd like to at least sketch an improved model of how we can understand these kinds of contact between uh, different uh, communities of inquiry. Uh, so what I'm going to propose here uh, is uh, a model of what I call uh, coordination. And I'm going to sketch this uh, only very lightly uh, uh, and in outline, um, but I'm happy to say more about it in the discussion. Uh, so what do I mean by coordination as opposed to integration? Well, one thing that it's meant to convey is that this is a, uh, a bicameral or bilateral process, uh, a process in which both sides have to give both sides have to flex. Uh, integration, I think, uh, tends to have a directionality built into it. And the directionality is uh, that traditional knowledge has to be trimmed to fit the, uh, to fit the outlines of academic knowledge. Uh, that's why debunking theories of traditional knowledge are given, or revisionist theories are given of it uh, in these integration projects. Uh, and I think this is a reflection of the differential power structures at play between the groups that are engaged in these projects. Uh, coordination is meant to be something that's a little more even-handed. Uh, so this is both a, a proposal of what is going on in these exchanges tacitly, and also a proposal of how they ought to be done. So ontological coordination, as I'm going to define it here, involves negotiating ways that communities can compare and exchange knowledge for mutual benefit despite the fact that they have divergent organization values and goals. That is, despite the fact that they might see the world in quite dissimilar ways and that they might uh, value different things and might indeed want different things out of the exchange of knowledge. Uh, and uh, the idea of coordination is that uh, both sides will come with their interests and values, will present uh, some, but perhaps not all, of what they know in a way that is suitable for the particular context of exchange, but which might not be suitable for another context of exchange. And when the exchange is over, what they will have in hand is something, although not necessarily the same thing, that will suit each of their uh, needs and demands uh, differently. So 
there are three components to coordination as I understand it. The first is that coordination is partial and often shallow. Uh, well, what do I mean by that? Uh, so uh, what I mean by partial and shallow is that only some aspects of a body of knowledge are activated in a particular dialogic context. All of the knowledge of a culture is never brought to bear as a whole in a particular exchange. In fact, as anybody who has looked at uh, ethnographic uh, research and at experimental methods on this, there are some wonderful reflections on uh, the uh, difference it makes uh, for one investigator rather than another to be carrying out an inquiry or to change the methods of elicitation that are used uh, when you're dealing with native informants. These can often elicit quite different uh, aspects of what informants know, just as talking to different informants can elicit different aspects of what is known by the culture as a whole. So only some aspects of a body of knowledge are presented and activated in any particular dialogic exchange. That's what it means for coordination to be, uh, to be partial. Uh, and in fact, uh, the aspects that are activated are often uh, ones that are most amenable to being seen in terms of academic ecological knowledge. That is, uh, the practices of elicitation will often only manifest those aspects of knowledge that can be reformulated in that way. Uh, Anna Lohenhaupt Singh has some marvelous reflections on this in her book, Friction, talking about list making uh, as a uh, practice of eliciting names uh, and the way in which it renders uh, people to be legible in a certain way uh, to their interlocutors. Uh, and uh, that, that this is not necessarily a natural way of becoming legible is something that she, uh, she notes. What it means to say that this is also shallow as well as partial is that only some, uh, that, that perhaps only the most uh, surface level aspects of a body of knowledge will be brought to bear. So to consider the shamanic ritual case again, the entire theory of what is going on when one enters a particular trance and is guided by a shaman after taking a particular brew uh, might not be brought to the table and evoked by a discussion with a neuropharmacologist about what this particular substance will do and how it is prepared and how it is found you might only get the phenomenally manifest aspects of the theory uh, in those kinds of discussions. And there are all sorts of reasons for this reticence. Uh, the deep content of a worldview might be held back strategically, for example, uh, just to minimize disagreement and reduce unpleasantness uh, in an exchange. So uh, partial and shallow exchanges are an inherent part of coordination. Uh, and that means that there are often quite good reasons why overlap is going to fail in these exchange contexts. Second of all, coordination is local and provisional. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, it's carried out, uh, obviously, in a particular time and place by particular groups of individuals within a context of trust and power relations and framed by a set of specific questions and interests. That is, it matters who is talking uh, to whom uh, in this context. So uh, an investigation by a group of, uh, of people from a government hunting bureau uh, talking to native hunters will go one way. Uh, a group of uh, anthropologists talking to a group of native hunters might go another way. Uh, it depends on the composition of the group. It depends on what they're interested in, right? Um, uh, and it also depends on how uh, richly developed these trust networks are. Uh, the same exchange produced uh, that's, that's uh, undertaken later might not produce the same result because the appropriate social contexts uh, aren't in place. Uh, so the outcome or the output of coordination is not necessarily determinate and universal. How you are able to coordinate between groups is in part a matter of who makes up those groups. And there are quite a bit of, an, uh, of research on investigator effects in ethnobiology. And it does turn out to actually make a surprising difference who's doing the investigation. So um, if the stakes and the power dynamics change, then the coordination that is achieved on one occasion may have to be perpetually reassessed and renegotiated. Uh, and in fact, uh, the desire for less than total transparency or less than total legibility might be something that also frustrates these exchanges and uh, cultural anthropologists are quite familiar with this fact. So this is just to draw attention to the process aspects of this rather than the product aspects of this. Finally, Coordination is neutral on the aim of convergence. And this is quite important. Uh, again, notice that in the case of uh, integration, 
what you want is to come together and to converge on a single body of knowledge that can be held up and taken away, right? That you put all of these pieces of the crown together into the jewel and then you get to run away with it, right? Or somebody gets to run away with it, right? Uh, but uh, convergence as an ideal is not uh, at all uh, implicit in processes of coordination. In fact, neither consensus nor dissensus is the explicit goal of coordination. Rather, each party has their own uh, notion of what a productive endpoint of the exchange will be. Uh, indigenous hunters might, in fact, have reasons for wanting to get information from you know, interlocutors from governments or NGOs or academics, uh, just as academics and NGOs might have reasons for trying to get information from indigenous uh, communities. Those interests don't need to be the same. Uh, and in fact, uh, if in the process one tries to make them the same by imposing the requirement that there is a single outcome that all parties could agree to, or, or worse, by suggesting that there might be a single outcome that only one party agrees to, uh, then, uh, then uh, you, uh, you can get a better picture of what's going on in these if you, if you recognize that uh, each party is looking out for their own, uh, their own particular uh, kind of informational takeaway in these cases. There isn't a singular product of coordination. That's not to say there isn't convergence in these cases. There might, in fact, be islands of convergence. And in, there might be a priority to find islands of convergence in some cases. But that's not a universal aspect of the project. Uh, and Singh, again, in her study in Friction, notes that uh, the many participants in a, in a particular forest conservation project that she's doing an ethnography of, all of them came away with a completely different understanding of what was achieved uh, in the exchange. Uh, but it was fine, but that's fine. You don't need to agree on, uh, on a, a single unique narrative of what happens in these exchanges. Uh, to think otherwise is to think that convergence is the inevitable outcome of productive engagements between bodies of knowledge. But it's not. That's a myth. Uh, so, uh, all right. Well, that's a lot, uh, obviously. And uh, I think it's time for a, a brief envoy uh, before we end. Uh, so, uh, envoy, very briefly to conclude. Um, the myth of natural categories, uh, the myth that uh, systems of gathering knowledge about the world will inevitably converge, at least in some large respect, with uh, respect to the view of the world that they come to and the integration project that it gives rise to, they misrepresent the content of traditional knowledge in, uh, I think, rather deep ways. And they also misrepresent the, con the conditions of its production, not to mention the conditions under which uh, the exchange of knowledge between academic and indigenous groups uh, can occur. Uh, so my suggestion is that a coordination approach would be preferable to a single-minded focus on integration on practical, theoretical, and also political grounds. So there we are. That's it. Thanks, everybody, for your time and attention. I see a few hands moving, so I'll consider that a win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you, uh, Dan. And if you have a, um, well, I already see that Mark has a question. <laughs> <I thought laughs> so, so right I out of the starting the game. Hi, Mark. I <laughs> Yeah. So please unmute if you have a question and also turn on your video. But Mark, you're already have one of those things. Okay, so it's me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mark. Uh, hi, Dan. Um, uh, good to see you. This is great. And I was, um, I'm, I'm super interested in it. And, it's, and I'm, I think I'm very sympathetic to the, the direction you're going and, and great questions. Uh, I was puzzled about um, uh, the, sorry, the, um, how the propositional versus practical knowledge distinction is playing out in your thinking here. So, and I, and I was feeling tensions that maybe I'm just not quite understanding the, the conclusions that you're driving for. Mm -hmm. So throughout the contrast seemed to be between academic and indigenous knowledge, knowledge. So academic is propositional and indigenous you were arguing is both propositional and practical and, and you can't pull them apart. Um, and so, yeah, the referential overlap, that's all prepositional stuff. But while the, the story of the Aruks and the other examples like shows how things like the, 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 the spirits are enforcing norms, which is going to influence the way you interact with the ecology. So the ecological knowledge is also deeply practical knowledge. But 
as you well know, there's lots of STS and anthropology of science that shows that academic knowledge is just shot through with practical things. And it's really just kind of a ideology of science that says this is, uh, it, this is not practical at all. So is, so to really kind of two things, two directions, is that, is, is it the upshot the academic knowledge should be, is it, that it shouldn't be treated as just propositional, that it's a, uh, like indigenous knowledge in this way, or do you want to maintain a distinction, in which case I kind of feel attention. And also yeah. I got puzzled by the knowledge exchange. If it's, knowledge exchange seems to be very much a propositional knowledge metaphor, right? I've got a belief that I'm going to give to you and then you can have it. But a practical exchange would be like you would adopt all of my practices and that's not what you're talking about here. Though again, maybe this is what the language of coordinate, I can, I can imagine coordinating practices, but that's not an exchange of practices in any sort of way. So maybe the meta, uh, the language there is just, yeah, so anyway, no, I'll yeah. some tensions around that. You're, you're definitely right that the language of exchange, uh, the, the language of exchange for practices is a little bit more awkward, right? And we tend to think of knowledge as something that can just be given and traded, right? Uh, again, I think that to the extent that that is true, and this I think gets to the point about uh, partial and shallow, right? Uh, th to the extent that that's the kind of thing that's being done, that is only propositional exchange, then it's it's a limited form of exchange from the point of view of traditional knowledge, precisely because that is only what is legible, right? Or only what is transparent within that representational idiom, right? Uh, but it, as a matter of fact, in most of the real contexts where coordination takes place, there's all kinds of learning and, and exchange of skills as well, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, learning how to get places, how to make things, uh, you know, how to, how to find and how to even even things like how to how to how to refer in a practical sense that is how to actually locate and identify you know a bird from its call when you can't see more than five feet ahead of you because of the uh, uh, of the, uh, the the tree cover yeah, recognition so, yeah so practical so these are so these are all when they're actually uh, deployed in context of coordination uh, a both practical and uh, and theoretical so that's that's of course true right uh, so I do want to be clear on that. Now you're you're right also that uh, I emphasized in in Berkey's definition the, the the practical component and I didn't bring it up in the technical and the science uh, sorry, academic ecological knowledge tradition and of course you're quite right that uh, uh, that science as it actually functions is also a set of practices and these are you know ways of materially engaging with stuff <laughs> and doing stuff and making it happen right um, uh, I think th th uh, so I don't at all want to deny that I think that's obviously true. Um, I, I think that so, uh, but uh, the the reason I was emphasizing the uh, I, I want I want I wanted the emphasis to go that particular way, not because I don't want to acknowledge that there are practices in science, but rather because the uh, thinking of integration in this way, the products are often uh, frozen representational bodies of information, right? Uh, the integration of this knowledge is something that is collected within the kinds of idioms of understanding and the idioms of representation that are prevalent in academic context. That is trans transportable, fungible bodies of information, right? Uh, and I think that part of this is, in fact, uh, a problem to think of it this way, because part of what you learn in the actual context of coordination is something that you that isn't fungible and isn't transferable in that way, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think you're yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't want to downplay that. There are practices at work in both uh, academic and traditional bodies of knowledge, uh, but the, the the ideology, so to speak, of uh, integration tends to emphasize only the representational side of it. And again, I think this is right. this is a misunderstanding. So yeah, yeah. except that ex in a larger theory of the sciences here, I'd have to unpack that further. Right. This is especially true, by the way, if you look at uh, at industrial uses and at what NGOs and conservationists are doing. It's very obvious that those are practically oriented interests as well, right? But yeah. different orientations. So, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yep. Um, Shalmeet, yep. Okay. First of all, thank you very much. I think it's a rich and fascinating um, topic. Uh, there is just for the lack of another word, not to be insulting. Uh -huh. I have a feeling that when you speak about the exchange, 
-hmm. It's a little bit of almost a step towards integration because we are speaking as though we have a bi-directional communication on equal footing. This is not really what happens. Mm -hmm. So if we're speaking about a tradition from a traditional perspective, because we, uh, uh, you presented and all of us presented the only thing that we can present, which is our perspective. Where do we get the perspective of the party, yeah. of the other party? What do they get from this? Why would they want it? How can it be not shallow when for it to be not shallow, we have to risk the deepest knowledge and preservation of our culture to strangers? Why would we do that? Yeah. So, okay, this is, you understand the list of questions that I have. It's a great question. And I think it, uh, I would have to, start talking for a long, a long time to really answer this adequately. So, uh, but I won't do that. Um, uh, I do, uh, so um, I did want to uh, flag uh, in the local and provisional section, uh, the, the fact that, when, that, that talking about exchange is, is precisely something that has its own power dynamics uh, and that these are often swept under the rug in uh, discussions of integration. And so my talk of coordination as a practice of exchange uh, was meant to uh, to be a, a gesture towards the fact that the parties can have different interests. Um, and, and in the paper that this is derived from, uh, I, I mentioned at one point uh, that to really do this seriously, um, and I'm not sure if it's ever actually done as seriously as it ought to be, <laughs> um, uh, to, to really do this seriously requires um, an ironic attitude about one's own worldview and commitments. <laughs> uh, that is, you have to be able to, uh, at a very deep level, suspend your own sense of what the world is like uh, and to treat that as itself uh, a, kind of, uh, a kind of construction that you can at least partially stand outside of or and, and at least think is on the table for renegotiation, right? Uh, because if you don't do that, then you're not exposing yourself in exactly the same way that indigenous participants often are in these cases. And the foundation of trust is precisely that kind of, uh, that kind of willingness uh, to do that. So uh, the idea that both parties can come away with their commitments uh, reconfigured uh, and that this kind of the ironic attitude on the part of the inherently more uh, powerful and well-positioned uh, interlocutors is something that's really essential uh, to that or to doing it uh, thoroughly, right? So um, yeah, I don't think that there's any, I mean, but of course these are just words. There is no guarantee that any of that actually works in practice. <laughs> uh, that's something that you, that's something that has to be, that as everybody who's done field work knows, you really have to take you know, years to establish the right kind of bonds between interlocutors to, uh, to get to the point where you can have those kinds of, uh, those kinds of exchanges. Um, they can be done on pragmatic grounds, right? For purely pragmatic reasons, for instance. Uh, uh, but uh, but those are and those are cases where shallowness and lack of legibility may be more tactically appropriate. On, on yeah. So so yeah, I think there's there's a lot to say about uh, about the normative dimensions of how people ought to engage in these kinds of practices. Again, I think Anna Singh writes most compellingly about this. Probably nobody else is quite as sensitive in the, in the actual writing of the ethnography to the, uh, these kinds of dynamics in practice, but I'll stop there, so yeah. Thank you, also you mentioned a paper. Do we have the reference to the paper? I would like to read it. Uh, yeah, I, I gave that, I, I gave that. Uh, we do have it, okay, thank you. Yeah, That's so fine, you. yeah. It's just coming out in an issue of studies in history and philosophy of biology and biomedical sciences. Thank you, uh, I just one word I want to share with you some of my motivations besides the intellectual interest. My daughter is doing her PhD in international negotiations over high seas. Oh, and I thought that, uh, in fact, I suggested to her when you started to talk to join us, she probably didn't get my invitation. I think that, uh, yeah, I think that besides my, I, I have deep personal interest in categories in general, and I thought that she might also benefit. I think, yeah, I, well, that's very generous. Um, I'll, I, in addition to the, the international aspects of this, there's um, uh, that also uh, 
one area that I'm particularly interested in here is science education in indigenous contexts, because there's, uh, there are, this is where these issues really come to a head in a major way, right? How are you going to develop scientific curricula in, uh, you know, for use in, uh, in traditional or indigenous contexts that appropriately uh, pull, that appropriately draws on both the academic uh, bodies of knowledge that they want to convey and uh, that gives an appropriate place to uh, the indigenous worldviews as well. It's, uh, it's a very hard problem. So, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. If I, if I could uh, maybe return to the uh, earlier discussion uh, that you're having about uh, propositional and practical knowledge, and I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I think I know what uh, propositional knowledge or information is, uh, but I'm not sure what is the technical meaning that you're using of, uh, of, of practical there. Because I mean, in my mind, many, much propositional information can be, can be practical. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if the practical thing, it sounded more like it practices, like sort of uh, uh, procedural types of knowledge as opposed to uh, 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 discursive knowledge. I'm not sure if that's the, the distinction, but uh, uh, I'm a bit concerned that these, the common uh, sense meaning of these terms and then more technical meaning is these terms can kind of drift around uh, a bit. And I, I'm not sure how it overlaps with something that sort of struck me um, from where I'm coming from in the, the the initial uh, definition uh, of uh, uh, indigenous knowledge that you use from Burks, I think, uh, you know, is cumulative, is culturally transmitted, and it's adaptive. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it's quite something to say that something is, is adaptive, um, and it's not quite clear what that means. I mean, unless you get really into it, it seems to be sort of placing this indigenous, I guess it's related to the concept of autonomy, but it's taking this knowledge, but this is you know, natural knowledge, this is biological knowledge, and the indigenous culture is being treated as sort of a biological adaptive framework, that the purpose of it is to, but when you talk about cultural evolution, it becomes very hard to define adaptation, you know, and what your, your metric actually is. And I, so I just want to kind of, you know, dump that uh, on you and, and see if we can see how these two different terms relate to each other. Yeah. Um, because, you know, one of the dangers, of course, is that you sort of in inscribe this idea of, uh, you know, the indigenous is natural versus the civilized uh, uh, scientific or academic. Yeah. Well, right. So I don't want to be doing that, uh, kind of, at least uh, not, not that kind of essentializing in this case. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And, and again, so the, the use of the term, the repeated use of the term indigenous here can have that effect. Uh, you wind up using it in this kind of uh, echolalia kind of way after a while. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't mean to imply that these are universal features. I'm just presenting these as uh, statistical generalizations that I think I can back up with a reasonable body of evidence in some of these cases. And uh, and I and the, I think this gets in a way to the sidebar that I didn't pursue on science. So the reason I don't I don't explicitly talk about scientific ecological knowledge as contrasted with traditional ecological knowledge, which some people do, is because science itself is polyvalent, right? So uh, you might mean by science a set of uh, a set of institutionalized practices that have a certain genealogy going back to the scientific revolutions, right? So uh, yeah, that is, the sciences are uh, bodies of uh, bodies of uh, doing experiments, making instruments and observations, right? Organizing into societies, exchanging information, right? They are names of institutionalized uh, institutionalized practices, so to speak, right? Uh, and those don't exist in most indigenous contexts. But there's another way of talking about science as a, a mode of cognition, right? As any mode of systematically thinking about and investigating the world and generating causal explanations about the world. And many people speak of indigenous science in that sense. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, I think that, that I prefer to talk about it in an institutional way rather than as a psychological process, uh, because this isn't really about the psychological processes that go on in these kinds of cases. So, um, uh, I think part of the uh, part of the distinction I was trying to get at between these two is to uh, gesture towards the fact that there are different social uh, and organizational structures at work in these in these different communities, and that's part of what's giving rise to these sorts of things. Now, that doesn't answer the practical the kind of practical and practices question. And uh, I very much wish that I had a really good definition of this here to help out, right? Um, my point here is I think really pretty 
perhaps too basic to really satisfy you. But what I mean by practices here are things like uh, what in the diagram of uh, the Cree, uh, um, uh, the kind of uh, various bodies of Cree culture, right? Uh, practices are things like ways of hunting and tracking uh, caribou, right? That might be that you might you know, teach somebody and know how to do, right? But that are never written down or, uh, you know, or expressed uh, uh, discursively, as you say, right? Or uh, ways of uses for various parts of caribou and ways of making them into uh, you know, useful things uh, that, again, are you know, transmitted through various, uh, you know, there are lineages of teaching that go on there. Uh, but they're not, again, uh, discursive. So my way of thinking of these ways of doing things is as embodying a kind of knowledge. And whether it's propositional or not, I don't really take a stand on because that's a complicated sort of question, right? I mean, my, my only point is that the knowledge can either be expressed discursively as the kind of thing that you could just tell somebody, or it could be expressed in a relatively embodied way by the fact that something is built a certain way, right? Uh, by the shape of a dwelling or the shape of a material artifact or by the a way of doing things, that these also count as uh, embodying a certain kind of knowledge. That's really all I meant by practice in this context. I'll say something really quick about adaptive here. Yeah, uh, that's another trigger word. Uh, and all I mean by adaptive uh, here is something I'm, I, I, I really don't mean in the kind of sense of cultural evolution here. I'm trying not to mean that, right? It would be overloading it a little bit. What I think the, the easiest way to think about this is that, uh, as you pointed out, this is a kind of knowledge that is developed and sustained in the context of having to, in, having to engage with nature uh, uh, as a matter of you know, living on a daily basis. And uh, its adaptive value is roughly the fact that it as a whole contributes to the flourishing and survival of the group that uh, that holds it. Now that's of course, that can't be a definition. It's really more of a hypothesis about these things. Like maybe they're maladaptive in various ways, but uh, that's the assumption that Burkus brings to it anyway. So sorry, that was very long, but uh, I hope that was a way of addressing your questions. No, but that, I mean, the last bit there is what I'm like a little bit concerned about, um, you know, is this, this idea of, of adaptation and what does it mean? And so we're taking, you know, a biological term, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but when, even when biologists study adaptation, they, they, they very rarely actually have data on uh, fitness effects in terms of surviving and reproducing offspring that they can quantify and they usually use proxies like, you know, calorie intake or, or something like that, uh, you know, and, and that's questionable enough, but it's also true that adaptations are something that happen to individuals, right? So if we start talking about cultural practices as being adaptive because they favor the, you know, the, the, the betterment of the group, we're sort of introducing a whole lot of stuff into that term that's not there in the biology, you know, and frankly, it's, it's quite easily wrapped up with ideas of progress and, and directionality, which you see in this term cumulative cultural evolution, which actually, as far as I can tell, doesn't mean anything because it implies that there's some direction or product. You have evolution and, and it's just, that's what it is, right? But we apply it to culture because we have this idea that there's this thing of cultural progress. And, and if we step away from that and say, well, how are we talking about, uh, you know, ad adaptation in a cultural context? Is, is it still about the individual? You know, I mean, it, it's about things that are culturally adaptive that help me by some metric, whatever metric I'm going to use. And then all these distinctions that you're, you're talking about, so they really dissolve because, you know, adopting a particular statistical technique is currently culturally adaptive for me, you know? Uh, and so, I don't know, I, it gets really, I think, Adaptation is an interesting term to use, but we have to be very careful that it doesn't bring with it a whole lot of baggage. Right, I agree. And so I'll say something really briefly, just as a quick rejoinder here. I think, uh, I think that's absolutely right. And I certainly would not want to have any kind of uh, theory of progress built into this. Uh, this is, uh, life seems to be pretty non-monotonic in general <laughs> these days. So uh, uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't want to imply anything like that. Uh, Try this on, uh, as, as, if, if the term adaptive uh, chafes too much, uh, which I think is reasonable, then uh, one way of thinking about this is what are the norms that generally shape and sustain this knowledge? And in the case of, uh, say, uh, the named disciplines, uh, the 
norms that shape them, and this goes back to the realism question, are often explicitly epistemic ones. The aim is to discover the structure of the world, to find you know, the, the natural kinds, to uncover really explanatory factors, right, to make good predictions and so on. So among scientific realists, uh, these kinds of epistemic norms are what is given uh, precedence. Uh, but uh, part of the aim of the autonomy discussion is exactly to show that these are not necessarily the primary concerns that uh, the uh, that uh, traditional knowledge is accommodating itself to. It's accommodating itself to a whole lot of different demands, uh, which pull in a whole lot of different dimensions. And so the normative structure of this, to say it's adaptive, is to say that the normative structure of this is in part geared towards just surviving in various ways, but also towards all kinds of other, broadly speaking, uh, uh, utilitarian or useful aims, uh, many of which have little to do with simply, uh, you know, maximizing epistemic success in any way. So that's maybe one way to think about it. Yeah, I don't want to just let the, the cultural evolution of bad science would be an example. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> but, but no, that's anyway. exactly right. Yes, any, yeah, lousy things can evolve too in culture. That's what television's for. Yeah. Hey, Dan. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Sam, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you, Dan. How are you doing? Um, I enjoyed the talk. I think I say, I share some of the concerns that are already on the ground, and I think that last pass starts to get closer to something. It starts to get closer to me uh, of like kind of doing away with perhaps some of the more politically maybe problematic ways of cutting up this, uh, you know, traditional ecological knowledge from academic uh, ecological knowledge divide. But it occurs to me, right, I mean, and I think this has already been kind of on the table, often the kind of discourse about our uh, academic ecological knowledge being motivated by some sort of pure epistemic norms turns out itself to just kind of be like, you know, a bad ideology of science, right? Like this is kind of one of the good lessons from early feminist philosophy of science is that our, you know, our knowledge projects in general are embedded in larger sets of cultural values. What kinds of, you know, research gets funded and promoted depends on the particular social context out of which that research grows, so on and so forth, right? Um, and so I wonder if, you know, uh, instead of cutting up the distinct, you know, ins instead of distinguishing in kind at all in any deep way between traditional uh, ecological knowledge and uh, academic ecological knowledge, you could rather just kind of talk about the, these kinds of collisions as just, you know, broader collisions of sets of cultural values. Uh, and if that gets around some of the issues, that seems to accommodate itself well to with this kind of uh, coordinating project that you wind up uh, pushing for in the long run. So yeah, I, I wonder if you're, you're happy with that way of distinction, that way of cutting things up and kind of dropping any hard and fast kind distinction between the sorts of ecological knowledge found in indigenous yeah. context and academic context. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sam. That's really helpful. I I, I would be amenable to that, and I. Uh, I sweated and fretted a lot over the way of spelling this out. And it's actually quite frustrating, really, in, if you read the literature on this stuff, because not only is there not as much consensus on how to understand uh, traditional or indigenous eco ecological knowledge, but the contrast class is never specified as sharply or as clearly as, the, uh, as that side of it, right? So uh, people never say, what is the perspective that they think they're coming from, right? Uh, uh, and lay it out in a way. That's why I couldn't find anywhere in the literature, really, a satisfying analog to Burke's definition. And so I had to try to you know, create one. I thought I'd give it a, give it a whack. Um, uh, I, I share, I think, the dissatisfactions that have been expressed here. And I think you're uh, picking up on Mark's point uh, really nicely as well. Um, so yeah, I think that um, at the, so the, the closest that I, uh, the closest that I'm coming here, and it, this has not been in the talk because there was already too much in the talk, but the closest, uh, that I think you can get to somebody who really holds uh, the sort of pairing of the referential and the autonomy thesis in the form that I'm interested in is Richard Boyd, uh, who does I think uh, whose version of scientific realism is, is what I've got to, is what I've got in mind here when I'm uh, when I'm targeting this. I can cite some points where Boyd more or less uh, says these things. Um, uh, so I think your uh, I think your amendment is one that I would be uh, fine with, right? It's certainly this is to at least some extent an ideology of academic uh, knowledge rather than a 
faithful portrait of academic knowledge. Uh, and I think that's clear from the sources that you're, uh, that you're citing there. Um, yeah, the more, the more nuanced portrait never finds its way into the actual uh, procedures of the, <laughs> of the work itself, which is what I found so frustrating in, in thinking about it. But yeah, I'm, I'm I think that many of these points go through just as well if you simply say, well, look, the values that are held by these two different communities, uh, these knowledge production communities, right, uh, or these communities who at least have an interest in producing knowledge, are ones that are misaligned in ways that give rise to the kinds of failures that I'm talking about here. And whether or not they really are you know, mainly centered on epistemic norms in the case of academic knowledge, maybe they're not, right? Uh, but as long as they don't, as long as their concerns and interests don't, and values don't line up with the traditional case, then you might still get these kinds of effects. So yeah, I, I need to think more about this, but I'm perfectly happy with that kind of amendment. Um, I think this is a, a vexed and difficult issue though. Yeah, thanks. Looking around, um, it, does anyone have any final question? And then we'll let Dan <laughs> um, to, yeah, um, take a break. Um, any final questions? Um, no? OK. Thank you so much, Dan, for, oh, oh sorry, yeah. thank, yes. Thank, thank, thank you, you so you. much. Really, uh, yeah, really, really. Real pleasure. <laughs> uh, this project is ongoing. There are more. Uh, and uh, it actually relates to another project on interfield integration in the biobehavioral sciences as well. Uh, uh, these kinds of general issues of how to integrate knowledge across fields and communities is something I'm thinking about. So if anybody wants to talk about any of this stuff further, please uh, get in touch. Uh, I think it's all uh, worth, worth discussing. And this was great. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you again. Thank you so much. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>